Hmm? Said one mimicking, said water, water. Hello, thank you for joining us. This is My Business, Your World. I'm your host, Dr. Graham. Today, my guest is Mr. Robert Christensen. Understanding is great. Taking action is awesome. Robert Christensen is a dreamer, a problem solver, an optimist, whose greatest strength is inspiring others to believe in their ideas, guiding people to flip over obstacles and problems to realize solutions within. Robert is also involved with the West Islip Child Daycare and Education Center, Babylon Center Care, um, pardon, Babylon Child Care Center, and West Islip Breast Co Cancer Coalition. Mr. Christensen, welcome. Hi, Corinne. Thanks for having me. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, some of these organizations that you're affiliated with and why those organizations in particular. Well, the West Isla Breast Cancer Coalition handles 26 different communities on Long Island that don't have coalitions of their own. So it's a little bit of a misnomer that it's called the West Isla Breast Cancer Coalition. That's where it started, but it grew significantly over the past 21 years. Uh, my function was handling media and distributing the messaging of the organization out into Long Island, which was part of why it grew so much. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about your background. Um, I know you have a, a new um, product, I would say, service or, that you've developed. But let's talk a little bit about the history of Bob, some of the, <laughs> the, the engagements that you've worked with. Uh, organizations, you don't have to name name, but this program is talking about my business, your world, in terms of what are some of the challenges that businesses have, especially small businesses, and to help them, you know, help get a targeted message out to them so that they can take those risks and become more successful and profitable. Great. Well, a little background. After I came out of the, uh, graduated here on Long Island from college and business administration, I went into the military. And after leaving the military, I went back into business and began working in different industries. Uh, over the past 30 years, I've worked in transportation. I've worked in the medical industry, food service industry, manufacturing, finance, banking, mortgage industry, and a number of others. I've had an opportunity to be consulting with these different companies and all different levels from million dollar to billion dollar companies. What became apparent were certain things in the environment that we read about now in the news, but have actually always existed, which is structures of the business are so rigid that people feel just wrapped up and, and, and strangled by trying to get something done. Or they're so fluid that people don't have a comfort zone where they feel confident that, well, the company will even be around tomorrow, so they don't know should they put out their all. Um, over time, as a manager, and as at the executive level, I developed a couple of different theories, one of them being the P4S2 program, which essentially has six parts and is meant to give people that structure with an enormous amount of flexibility so that they can, they can really communicate, they can collaborate, and they can be creative without violating company rules or federal or state regulations. They have an area where they can come in and absolutely know they can display and be self-expressed as fully as possible within the business environment, and it benefits the benefit of business. All right. I'd like to find out a little bit more about this P, uh, P4S2, but let's, what are some of the, the, the reasons that you then, I guess, went into this? I mean, what are you, you've been in a couple of different industries. Um, when did you start developing the product? What what last project made you think about this? Good question. Um, where I began was as a new manager. It, start, it became apparent to me, as I mentioned, some of the things that just didn't work. So I began asking, why don't they work? And over time, I, when I asked those same questions, the same answers kept coming up, no matter what industry or business I was in. We'd have new hires coming in that weren't completely comfortable and could not get up to speed in any less than four months. Well, I thought four months is a long time for somebody to be working and not actually know what they're doing. <laughs> You'd really want to come in and, and know that up front. And it was more than just a job description. It was, it was directly 
relating to them as a human being, as a person, coming in working with other people. So I looked at it from a people-centric point of view, not from a product or a service or a market. My focus was on the people inside the business. And from that standpoint, you could have the best, absolutely the best building, the finest computer equipment, and maybe even the most profitable product in the world. But if you didn't have people being of service to people, then your business wasn't going to flourish. So we were looking for productivity. We were looking for performance. We were looking for profitability. We were looking for all the things business wanted to look for and find it within the person. Now, when I began addressing those individual needs for the people rather than saying, well, let's find a cheaper pencil or let's find a better copier machine, we began realizing enormous increases in our productivity, in our performance, and in our profitability. For instance, blank spots, blind areas to the owners and managers of the company were brought to the light by the employees who saw them because they saw an opportunity for themselves to be acknowledged, to be recognized, to be appreciated. Those three little pieces going into the whole program developed and I started practicing them, seeing the results, writing it down and saying, hmm, this is something that's really good. Let me try this elsewhere. And it began demonstrating the same results in business after business. How I came about the program ultimately was uh, a very good friend of mine said, you helped my company so much and I saw you kept repeating certain things. Have you ever written them down? Have you ever made it into a book or, or a program? And then he turned around and said, I just want you to teach my people that. So that was really the genesis. I want you to create a training of only those elements. And that will teach everybody in my company how to do that. And it will be a self-mentoring program. So that was pretty wild that it, became, it came about just, you think, by design. But in, in essence, it was somebody saying, don't deliver anything else other than those pieces because that's great. And that's really where it came from. How long did it take you to get this um, finished, registered, and so on? Oh, well, registration is an easy thing you do online nowadays. But to put the elements together, I started originally, there were 15 pieces. And th through working it out in trials and classrooms and, and group sessions and seminars, we boiled it down. As I, as I worked it out, I kept shaving pieces off, consolidating it and coming up with finally the six that compose the core central part of the program. And it's easily digestible at that level. Okay. So let's talk, I guess, and go into P4S2. Right. What is it? <laughs> okay. Well, as I said, it, it, it really encourages communication, collaboration, and creativity. Um, I use the analogy during the course of imagine you have a rubber box. Everybody likes to think, uh, have everything happen inside the box for control, but they also want you to think outside the box. And I decided to make the box flexible. So it remains a box, and you can expand it as necessary when opportunities or challenges come up without breaking the box. Very interesting. I think we're probably going to come up on our first break. Um, so before we go into that, let's talk a little bit about um, what does it stand for? <laughs> okay. I know it's it's kind of an <laughs> innocuous name. It's like it's like PX90 or something. <laughs> what it stands for is to uh, provide and protect, supply and support, and predict and prevent. Those are the six core segments of the P4S2 program in which all activities of a business occur. And they really do actually occur no matter what level of business you're at. So that if everyone is talking from that same platform, that same program, then you are self-mentoring your entire organization from the top down and back up and opening up collaboration, creativity, and communication. Everybody knows what, they, what sheet of paper they're speaking from. And there's no limits to it. It's just a matter of how big do you want to get? How much money do you want to make? How much fun do you want to have in business? Those are the questions that come up during the program training that people are really surprised when they hear, oh, fun? <laughs> We're supposed to have fun at work? Yeah, you should, because the more fun you have, the happier you are, the more productive you are. Yeah, that's absolutely um, right on. 
How many uh, of you or helped develop this product? Was this just you with the, you know research and testing, or did you have other colleagues or pairs? I mean, you mentioned that one of the clients that you did the same uh, training and development for, she said, why don't you just put it together? Were mm -hmm. there any other individuals instrumental in this, or this was just solo? Pretty much over time, myself, but I, I think all of the companies and the people I've worked with are my collaborators, and they're my helpers, and they're my partners in it. Um, but the, the testing and, and the work through as I work for different companies, that really was all me. So I'm the one who put, put it down and ultimately will carve out the entire courseware for this program to make sure that it's deliverable consistently. All right. Well, let's take our first break. Thank you for joining us. Again, this is My Business, Your World. I'm your host, Dr. Graham, with my guest, Mr. Robert Christensen. If you have any questions, you can reach us at 631-481-9124, or you can send us an email at info at Graham Consulting and Research. Thank you. My name is Dr. Robert Brevar. I'm here for Multimedicine in Westbury, New York. We're located at 1065 Old Country Road, Suite 214. Been here for about 15 years. The practice has medical doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists. We also do pain management and we have orthopedists on staff. Here at Advanced Multimedicine Rehabilitation, we've got physical therapists on staff who treat an array of conditions from neck pain to back pain, shoulder pain. We treat carpal tunnel. We treat a lot of car accident patients, slip and falls. We treat patients with knee injuries, with ankle injuries. We have state-of-the-art equipment. We've been here for over we 15 years. We do a vast years. array of diagnostic testing from x-rays to EMGs. What is an EMG? It's a diagnostic test that allows a doctor to determine where the pinched nerve is. Cora is a physical therapist at Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. She's working on Stephanie, who was involved recently in an automobile accident. Stephanie has tight thoracic and cervical musculature, and Cora is doing some myofascial release work and some therapeutic stretching doing it to help her with her pain. Vicky is also a patient here at Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. Vicky is now working her leg muscles, specifically her quadricep muscles, trying to strengthen them after an injury she sustained. find yourself in need of any type of physical therapy, please don't hesitate to call Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation, located in Westbury, New York, in Suite 214. Phone number is 516-334-7000, or find us on our website at advancedmultimedicine.com. Dr. Robert Brevar. I'm here for Multimedicine in Westbury, New York. We're located at 1065 Old Country Road, Suite 214. Thank you for joining us again. This is My Business, Your World. I am your host, Dr. Graham, with my guest, Mr. Robert Christensen. Um, so we're talking about uh, this new system that you developed, mm -hmm. B4S2. Did I get it right? Yes. All right. <laughs> um, and obviously, based on your years of experience in the industry in a number of different capacity, you felt mm -hmm. there was a need. You have clients who's given their testimonial to say, well, this works, it's effective. You ever thought about, you know, developing a system mm -hmm. and then just teaching us. Now let's talk about what are some, I guess some of the industry that these, uh, this, this will work best in. Is this something service? Is this something manufacturing? What are some of the challenges to implementation as well? Well, the more dynamic of an industry or a business, then the more problems that occur and the more challenges for communication and decision making. This really did come about from a decision making problem where I realized I had a staff and people weren't making decisions. Why? And I went about looking at it. And I was in the service industry and it worked really, really well, no matter whether it was a transportation business or it was a food service where you have a, a product and a service combined. 
the dynamic nature, the faster the pace, the more important was that the staff, the rank and file, the employees were confident in being able to make a decision on the simple things that come up rather than always coming back to me. As you can imagine, if you're a manager and you have a staff of 40 or 20 or 80 people, if everyone is coming to you for a decision, at the end of the day, your head's going to explode because they're not thinking. They're reacting. What I wanted to do is transform that reaction into a decision-making thought process. So that's, that was the genesis of how this all came about. I needed a decision-making organization, not a lot of people running around saying, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? So in service, it works really well. Now in manufacturing, there are just as many problems that come up, except there will be internal, and then there will be the external, the customer's experience. Well, in that case, it can be applied to both. It's just a matter of who you're working with. Internally, it's the people on the floor, then there's people in the office, and you have a support staff outside that also needs to be able to understand you may not know everything about a product, but you have a team that you can collaborate with. So when a problem comes up, it's, you're addressing it in a manner of which is going to be successful for yourself, for the customer, and for the company entirely. So in that way, they understood there's a win-win-win opportunity for them, rather than seeing as, oh, I've got another problem to handle, or I've got another service ticket to deal with. What am I going to do? Oh, it's now a we environment. Well, here's my problem. I'm not 100% sure. Let me check here, here, here. Great, now I've got a solution. I come back to my customer and I tell him as a team representing the company, we have solved your problem. I'm putting it into place right now. Is there anything else I can help you with? He feels really confident. The customer feels really confident. Therefore, we're going to have more business. So again, it's a win-win-win opportunity for everybody. I could see this applied to almost any industry you can select. And apply it so that it either is going to completely replace whatever is being done, or better, it augments the successful practices already in place. All right, well, let's talk about in terms of how does this roll out, because this will affect your middle level, your managers, and all the way up to your C-suite. And I think while decision making is so critical and you want to have it at your, your line and it's also a lot of the time it's the over the, the managers and the senior levels that uh, actually create a lot of the challenges. Mm -hmm. So how does a system work or collaborate with a lot of their decision making uh, process and what needs to happen? Right. Well, again, it's people centric. So I'm very sensitive and focused on working with people no matter what level they're at regardless of their title or, or, and their accomplishments, I want to leverage all of that for the benefit of the organization. So if you're looking at, say, the C-level, clearly they have a vision for the organization, and they have objectives. They have outcomes they want to occur, revenue uh, projections that are made, profits that are made. We work from that standpoint. If you, you say, well, here's the return on the investment in which you're going to have a consistency in your organization where your profitability is also more consistent, and that is a correlation. As I have seen consistency leveraged throughout the organization with a structure that they can count on and they have confidence, the consistency appears, barring some major economic meltdown, for the performance of that company within that industry, they also end up resulting in a better consistency of pro profitability. And who wouldn't want that? You, know, <laughs> you say, no executive that I've ever met wouldn't say, oh, wow. So I could say that the next four quarters are going to be profitable, and it will be so. That's a totally different conversation for them. Now, there are some people who, of course, we all run into where they deal with this uh, command and control type of environment, where they really do want to be the center of what's going on. OK, they actually will remain the center of what's going on, because they're going to be the facilitator as a mentor, as a leader in that department or that division or the entire company, bringing everybody up and making them all being empowered to have a greater level of, of opportunity within the organization. So, so they will win no matter what happens because all their people are now solving their problems. 
as they're coming up. They're also communicating. It's not, they're not little fiefdoms. They're not operating independently of the company. There is, it's communication. They're talking to one another. They're collaborating. And they're resolving problems creatively, you know, creatively without violating any state, federal, or company laws. They're operating at a much higher level of performance than ever before, making the person who's in charge of that department just look great. And who wouldn't want that? Right. Um, just uh, in terms of do you then train or work with these uh, departmental heads first before uh, and develop the strategy to implement P4S2? How, how does that, how do you transition when you go into the company? Do you start with them? First, in terms of developing that, you know, rolling out that strategy, or is it once you go in, you've, you have, you know, you're the overview of what needs to happen, you go straight to the employees that this, they're reporting to? Uh, well, yeah. I'm going to deal with the, the, the business uh, unit directors, the stakeholders, the decision makers first. Their buy in is critical. They are the existing leadership structure of the organization without them there's going to be a natural conflict between whatever I'm working with and the employees and the management. That Do they actually um, actually are on that training program mm -hmm. or process with you, or they're just on in the beginning and then? Oh, no, they participate. Okay. They, it's, it, this is an all-encompassing program for the company um, where we are looking at all avenues, all areas, all segments of the company, and therefore we must look at and work with the C-level. I, I must work with you know, middle rank managers as well as supervisors and the people out in the field. Work with them all because this is, this is the entire environment that we're dealing with. This is a, a P4S2 program affects the business environment and anyone who enters into that business environment is exposed to that. So obviously a C-level executive is. So is a manager. Now, that's one of the tough things oftentimes is to get the time for your C-level suite to become involved and engage in programs, even though it is what they want and they want to get for the company. How much of their time uh, do you get in any given uh, training program that you're running? Is it usually a four-week or, uh, you know, two months? Um, and how much time are they able to commit to coming into being on one of the, any one of the programs that you have running? Well... Knowing that there's a time constraint and that they're very focused, I appreciate that. I've been there. So having owned my own companies and also being at the executive level, the decision-making, the visionary, to say, all right, I'm going to put together something of akin to a four- or eight-hour, not a day off, but it's a, a session where we pull them away. Yes, I'm going to have breakfast, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> and I'm going to have a nice lunch. And we're going to involve this, and we're going to cover all six segments. And we're going to make decisions as to how your business fits in this at the 50,000-foot level. My job is to drill down and do the business analysis, ask the questions, to find out one simple question. It really is an answer. It's a three-part question. What, by when, how much? For almost every person in the organization. I'm going to work with HR as well. I will not be out of a line with their legal department. I will always be with their compliance department. All of these pieces are going to be put on and into the program, so we're building the box. I mean, I used the demonstration, but by using this program, we're actually building a customized version of this for each company. So it's not a pat answer. It's not, here's your deck of cards and go and play. Right, culture in every organization is different and it has to play into... Exactly. I mean, the truth is you could have two companies that produce exactly the same product in the exact same market and do it the exact same one. Like you've seen the commercial about the Twix bars on TV where there's the left and the right bar, the same candy, right? But this one does it this way and that one does it that way. The difference in those companies is the people. That's the real difference. Why will two companies who make exactly the same product in the same market with all of the advantages, one will flourish and the other will fail? It has to do with how the people are operating in the company. And I've been through enough crisis periods in the economy and also with different industries where there's been regulation changes and there's been huge change. You know, the publishing industry and transportation industry had massive changes. 
And it was interesting to see that the dynamic of this program in place, the flexibility, allowed people to make adjustments. And they didn't, well, for lack of a better term, they didn't freak out. They didn't, they didn't lose it because the sky was falling, the world was coming to an end. What they did was they saw opportunities in all of the stress and the problems occurring around them. And they went, hey, if I just flip this over, which is one part of the program, how to flip your problems over and see the opportunities underneath. And then take a, oh, I, I know how to do that. Oh, here it is. There's the opportunity. Let me go here. That all came into place and made these companies very successful. And they're still around to this day. That's interesting. Now, let's talk about some of the challenges. Mm-hmm. Well, time is one. People may already have programs in place that they uh, have committed to. Um, they may feel that this is a good idea, uh, but they want to finish whatever they're in the process of doing before they move on to the next thing. They may feel that it's such a departure that they want to, they, they can't see it. That's a conversation, really, but they at first may think of it as such a departure from how they're doing things, they're afraid of loss, afraid of losing whatever they already have in place and they're gaining. I uh, mentioned command and control. There are people who will have a, they've worked really hard to get things running. And even if it's not running as well as they want it to run, they stick with it because it's running. And that's a natural psychological phenomenon for most people. When we create a theory or a rationalization or a reason for something, we also automatically defend it because we created it. Same thing with how businesses run and solutions. I created this solution, even if it takes 53 different steps to get it done, and it takes days worth of work to do it, but at the end we have it done. Then you have someone like me come in and, and show them this actually only takes two hours, <laughs> and you now have three days worth of productivity. I, I have case studies in which I have sat down with sales business units that were doing the exact same thing. Um, one unit was doing, there were six units uh, in the sales group. Each group was doing the same exact thing. They were using different technologies and different techniques to pull it together. Be on average, it was taking each person within the group 60 hours a month to accomplish a commission report. That's what their job was, to, to put together the commission report. Now, they justified it because it was their job. And they justified it because before the end of the month, they got the report done, which was the goal. Month end report, I'm done in three weeks. Brilliant. I looked at all six of them, come to find out they're spending 360 payroll hours just generating this report. A little bit of conversation with IT, a little bit of conversation with the data warehousing people, and I come up with a solution wherein they're now able to get that job done in 60 hours, gaining 300 payroll hours for the company. 300 hours, or in essence, 50 hours each, which is more than a week's worth of time that they could be focused on marketing, supporting their salespeople, making things happen in the company, servicing clients. Mm -hmm. But they defended it, or they actively defended it because they were getting the job done in under a month. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, let's come back on that because that's oftentimes what has happened in terms of efficiency in a lot of companies, whether they're small, one, uh, one person's running it, so mm -hmm. on and so forth in terms of efficiency. Again, this is My Business, Your World. I'm your host, Dr. Graham, with my guest, Mr. Robert Christensen. Before, been here for about 15 years. The practice has medical doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, we also do pain management and we have orthopedists on staff. Here at Advanced Multi-Medicine Rehabilitation, we've got physical therapists on staff who treat an array of conditions from neck pain to back pain, shoulder pain, we treat carpal tunnel, we treat a lot of car accident patients, slip and falls, we treat patients with knee injuries, with ankle injuries, we have state-of-the-art equipment, we've been here for over we do 15 years. We vast array of diagnostic testing from x-rays to EMGs. What is an EMG? It's a diagnostic test that allows a doctor to determine where the pinched nerve is.
Cora is a physical therapist at Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. She's working on Stephanie, who was involved recently in an automobile accident. Stephanie has tight thoracic and cervical musculature, and Cora is doing some myofascial release work and some therapeutic stretching to help her with her pain. Vicky is also a patient here at Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. Vicky is now working her leg muscles, specifically her quadricep muscles, trying to strengthen them after an injury she sustained. If you find yourself in need of any type of physical therapy, please don't hesitate to call Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. Located in Westbury, New York, in Suite 214. Phone number is 516-334-7000. Or find us on our website at advancedmultimedicine.com. My name is Dr. Robert Brevar. I'm here for Multimedicine in Westbury, New York. We're located at 1065 Old Country Road, Suite 214. Been here for about 15 years. The practice has medical doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists. We also do pain management and we have orthopedists on staff. Here at Advanced Multimedicine Rehabilitation, we've got physical therapists on staff who treat an array of conditions from neck pain to back pain, shoulder pain. We treat carpal tunnel, we treat a lot of car accident patients, slip and falls. We treat patients with knee injuries, with ankle injuries. We have state-of-the-art equipment. We've been here for over we 15 years. We do a vast years. array of diagnostic testing from x-rays to EMGs. What is an EMG? It's a diagnostic test that allows a doctor to determine where the pinched nerve is. Cora is a physical therapist at Advanced Multimedicine and Rehabilitation. She's working on Stephanie, who was involved recently in an Shoot. Thank you for joining us again. This is My Business, Your World. If you have any questions or numbers, 631-481-9124. You can send us an email at info at grahamconsultingandresearch.com. I'm here today with my guest, Mr. Bob Christensen. And we were just chatting about reining into efficiency, and it is, it's very, very important, critical for the success of any business. Mm -hmm. So here it is, you're reining in and talking about payroll hours. We know that one of the biggest operating costs on, for most businesses or organizations, it is payroll, the payroll yeah. expenses. And saving 300 hours, depending on the size, it's still 300 hours. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a significant amount of uh, dollars to the bottom line. Absolutely. And also it's, you know, it, it just snowballs if you're all focused on one area and we need people who are capable of, of confidently multitasking uh, because that's especially a small business. If you have a small business, uh, one or two people, yeah, you are, you're everything. You're doing it all. Let's say you have 15 people in your organization. You need to be able to delegate in confidence to those people to get things done. And for them to give feedback saying, you know, it's, I know my job is to do a report, but I don't think it makes sense that I'm spending three weeks to do a report. The construct of, you know, to, to really get people providing and, and, and predicting and preventing falls into that area where you take a look and say, okay, let's predict what it is that we're going to do, and whether we have the results or not, what are we looking for? We're looking for it as fast as possible, as inexpensively as possible, and that it's accurate. So you, you would prevent a waste of someone spending, in this case, 360 hours to do a 60-hour job. And that means that instead of every, each individual spending 60 hours, they were now spending maybe what? five, ten hours, and at that point when they saw what was possible, they then could say, hey, what if we could do this in two hours, which is what happened in the case. They then said, you know, it's, it's, they went and collaborated with the data warehousing people, and they hadn't spoken before. You know, they never really spoke. They didn't know each other. <laughs> it was all about communications. So they, I introduced them. We had a conversation. We had a nice little meeting in this, 
in this, the goal of, of, of improving productivity, the, the return on investment was then easy for me to demonstrate because if here I am for the investment in, in my program and I go and say, well, here's 300 hours back, thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really not that difficult to figure out. But then they took it a step further and they dropped it down to two hours because they had been shown that they could. Yeah. Not so much that they could, but because they, they were empowered to and they had that ability to do it. It's so important to empower the employees in any organization, obviously of a culture. Uh, it's important, it has to be aligned with the vision and the mission of, of that organization. But even for small businesses, while it's not maybe there, the first thing that you often hear is, oh, that's a, 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 a above my pay grade or some, some kind of smart mm -hmm. uh, re remark or something, you can still look at that where it doesn't make sense for you to be doing the collections and so on where you can pay someone X buck, get, get an intern or so on where you can now focus on what kind of marketing strategies you need to get out there and, and get some more business so that you can grow from just you to, to three or so and so forth. I mean, it's great if you just want to be a sole entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. If you have that entrepreneurial vision, then you need to grow and you need to grow, you know, relative at a, at a, at a, um, a, a you know, steady pace, so to speak, so that you can hone in on that. So talk about some of the, the, the I guess, the, the clients or the type of, Organizations that you're rolling this out to. I know you shared some of the, the, you know, some of the challenges that one will have, which is normal, I guess, when you're trying to pr help to provide a training program. And once they see how viable it is, mm -hmm. they will definitely either do you run it parallel, I guess, just to jump in with maybe their system uh, and just to see the outcome where they can measure it and, and kind of. Well, it it that is completely dependent on the organization. Um, my experience has been there's, I'll use three types, although there's many more, but three types for simplicity. Those who have a successful running program and they're very happy with the results and they're always looking for the next, the, the edge. They're looking for the next level. They're looking for something that is going to bring them up another one, two, five percent in growth. And they have achieved what they've achieved successfully and totally acknowledging it with what they currently are doing and they're looking for more. So that's one organization I would work with. Second is they have gone through the trouble and the expense and the effort to implement a system and have done a poor job of it. Maybe they just fell back into the old habits they had prior to implementing it. Uh, they may have had a change of staff or a change of the environment that they're operating in the marketplace and they have had to make a switch in their company that has taken key stakeholders on the program. And that's a that's significant difference between my program and many others, that if the key stakeholders in many programs leave for a better opportunity, for dismissal, or just because the company can no longer support them, then they lose the fulcrum leveraging that entire program in their organization. It just falls apart. Because it never had an opportunity to gain traction and really set deep roots down so that the company can grow from it. The third are people or companies that look at that and say, it's too much time, it's too expensive, I don't see the value in it, I can't be bothered, I got what I got is what I got and I'm good enough. That, and those are not what I would call a hard sell. Those are all an education opportunity. Simply to go and provide, and a lot of what I do when I'm consulting or as you would say marketing or or providing the service uh, opportunity for them is to take one of the segments in, in their business, sit down and show them exactly uh, in a space of an hour what's possible. Now, again, it is a conversation and it's usually uh, a very powerful distinction that I bring about as to you know, where you are now and where you want to get to. That's where needs analysis comes in and I'm a master at that. So then the, they see, they're telling me where the needs are. I show them where they are and where they're going and where they can go, and the difference between the two is what we call the gap. And once they see the gap, they understand the needs, but they may not know the solutions. Well, program is one of the solutions. And I'm, I'm humble enough to say is I will also identify if it is not the solution for them. Because you and I and many other people in our capacity know who we want to work with, and it can't be everyone. 
you know, the one size doesn't fit all kind of no. um, mindset. So how does, I guess, a business would go about integrating the P4 S2 program, correct? Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> it's a tongue twister, right? <laughs> well, I have to think about it. Is it, you know, I guess you want to say PS, isn't there like, a, you have like games, or I think you mentioned before, like an exercise program that says P something. Right, so that is, you, P, well, you get, PX90. Get used to, you get, get used to it. <laughs> well, it's also from the standpoint of wanting to be as direct as possible as mm -hmm. to what it relates to. And it does raise a question. It's a simple question. And it's, it's funny how often this comes out in our sessions with the companies where I say, if you, if you want to implement something, make it intriguing. Give it an intriguing name. And it, it begs the question naturally, what's that? The whole goal of that is to begin a conversation because everything is possible in a conversation. No matter what it is, Include we're here meeting our we're meeting here today because it was a conversation. So everything is possible in a conversation within the organization. That's where I start doing the implementation. I, I my very first session with any group is a conversation where I'm asking questions as to what it is they want to do, where do they want to go. It's all it's all future forward. It's not looking back saying, well, we tried this and this didn't work, and we tried. I get that automatically. That, I don't even have to ask about that. That just shows up. So I just keep it future forward as to where we're going. This is, it's, and demonstrating the validity of the program from the day one by actually using it within the structure of my education. So when I'm doing the training, I am adapting my program for them as they are adapting the program for themselves. Okay. Rather interesting. Now, uh, talk about the business units who, which, who will be responsible for this implementation for this program. Okay. Well, I mentioned uh, before that C-level executives, owners, that's critical. Uh, also, HR, compliance, legal, whether they're internal or external, they have to be involved uh, simply because we're, we're putting this together and we don't want to, we're talking about making you know creative decision making within the rank and file of the organization therefore they have to understand the rules of engagement for the business in that particular industry from day one so if I was working with the financial industry uh, there are massive and many regulations in that mm -hmm. and all too often we read about people who were you know, creative decision makers who manage to stumble and, and violate a lot of laws. They break the law. I don't want to see that happen. Or if you're in healthcare, similar environment. Food services. Uh, you have, you know, health codes that have to be followed. So those, those are the, the, the structural elements that go in to the program so that that's the context of what we're working with. The goal is the enhancement and of the people and their performance. That's where we want to get to. I mean, it's similar to the area where you're working in, where you're looking at performance, because we all know if people are performing better, productivity is improving, and we're making more profits. You know, the three magic P's of business. <laughs> okay. All right. L let's talk about, and then we'll probably wrap up because it's it time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> uh, let's talk about how long of an implementation process is this? Because I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking while you're getting all the key. Uh, department heads involved, it takes time to build that, to integrate so that everything is, you know, mm -hmm. compliant. It's what it needs to be all the mm -hmm. T's, uh, you know, T's are crossed, all the, you know, and all the I's are dotted and so on and so forth. How long of a process is that? And then just give us, you know, we'll wrap up with you, give us some takeaway, you know, some experiences or things that businesses need to be mindful of when they're, sure. in terms of 2015 and, you know, growth and so on. Okay, excellent. Well, on an implementation, it's based on the scale, the size, the scope of the company. If it's a very large organization in the industry, one of the industry leaders, and we're dealing with a multinational, international work environment, we're going, I'm going to work in one area, one division, one segment. And funnily enough, I, I usually select and ask for uh, the worst performing set group that's going. One of the reasons I do that is because eyes are already on them to begin with. 
And they've taken great pains, the management, to gather all of the metrics and the numbers and they have them on the leaders board and they have, they, they have all the information I need to work with, which is a big time saver. So I can then come in and begin working with that, that group, that division immediately. Only because they've, they, well, we're the worst. Okay, well, we know where you are. Because that, that's where I would typically try to find people. Where exactly are they? Well, now I know. Okay. Now, the second thing is, is if, let's say we pick a small business that's got 150 people. I'm going to say that at best, we can be done in 30 days. And at worst, we can be done in 90. The difference is that they have an existing system that we have to work and overlay in. We're going to have to work and see where the points of connection are. But if they have nothing, it goes a lot faster. Almost paradoxical, you would think, oh, well, they're already used to the system, so they're used to a new system. No, they're used to an old system. They have nothing in place at all. It's, well, it's, it's like if you were going clothing shopping, you know, you, you knew nothing about clothing. Everything looks good. So that's how it occurs for them. Now, being mindful of what's coming up in 2015, it's the same thing that's been appearing for a while. Why I keep harping about collaboration is it is huge. We have, the media has blessed us with generation, the millennial generation, the 80 million people who are coming of age. And we also have boomers and Gen Y. We have all these different generations coming through. They all have their perspective, their point of view. They all have their experience. They have their knowledge, their capabilities, and their limitations. Youth has wild imagination and such creativity. And the older generation has a, an immense amount of experience. And that is, in essence, a way of saving time. And if we can meld the two together, not saying, oh, no, you're young, you don't know what you're doing, but saying that's an awesome, awesome idea. As my bio says, I love ideas. I'm a, I'm a uh, defender of ideas. You have some great ideas, and here are the resources, and here are the people who can help you make that happen today. That's collaboration. That's creativity. That's looking at opportunities and leveraging them, making a decision. Now you're coming up to the executives and you're saying, hey, we saw a problem. Here's a solution. Here's how we would go about implementing it. Here's what we need from you. This is how we can do it. Who wouldn't want that? But you have to be mindful that the biggest problem is there are blinders on, there are filters that we're gaining too often from the media and not actually looking in our own organization and saying, here is what is possible. Here is what we can create. Here is what we are going to be dominant in. Instead of saying, oh, well, you know, they say, the, how many times have you heard companies saying, oh, we'd love to do this, but, you know, the economy. The economy is the economy. There are still companies who are flourishing in any economy. Even the worst economies we've suffered in the past six years, they still, companies flourished and succeeded. Why? Well, they focused on themselves and their people and their marketplaces, and they looked for opportunities even inside of the worst of the problems. Yeah, now, this is a perfect, uh, I think this will be a really good year, uh, 2015, for you to help to launch that because that's what kind of the P4S2 will also help them to look at and transition mm -hmm. and look at some of those opportunities. Uh, as well. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, really this is appreciate your time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, this is my business, your world. Again, my guest today is Bob Christensen. If you have any questions for us, 631-481-9124, or you can send us an email at info at Graham Consulting and Research. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Tom Dow. We have a multidiscipline practice in Melville and run Cockman, New York, and we treat patients with many, many different conditions, from newborns through geriatric patients with numerous different techniques. Uh, there's a technique and a, a type of treatment for every class of patient. We have them all here.
Here's my son Thomas, also a doctor of chiropractic, working on one of our patient's cervical spine. This patient has had chronic neck pain for many, many, many years, has been to a multitude of different practitioners with little or no response. And with our specialized techniques, she has improved tremendously and continues to improve on a daily basis. Uh, we have two practices, one in Melville and one in Ronkonkoma, New York. We are a multidiscipline. Again, thank you for joining us, My Business, Your World. Dr. Graham with my guest today, Mr. Bob Christensen. Um, Bob, let's, um, I know that this is a new product uh, development that you have. Uh, tell us a little bit more, I guess, so that you have and you can share with examples, industries. We talked about a little bit about services, mm -hmm. a little bit about the manufacturing, you know, look at a little bit more as small business, mm -hmm. and so on. Sure. Um, Use an example of manufacturing and without naming companies because they always, there's somebody who will always have a difficulty with that. So in this case, they were doing a consumer product, uh, well established in an industry that had a strong need. And it's very popular here on Long Island. Uh, and it involves swimming pools. Now, the structure of that business was such that they do manufacture uh, on demand and also for commercial sales. It's um, a very customized product. So each individual, it's very difficult to come up with uh, uh, just a general thing you throw on the store shelves. You, you actually have to send teams out and make all sorts of measurements. The internal uh, problems that they were experiencing were, of course, that they had a great need almost immediately for when an order came in to be able to fulfill it because that represented the cash flow. What they didn't realize was that they were having problems on the back end with uh, collections of money, which is a standard issue with everything. I, I kind of grew up in the commercial collections environment with transportation. You know, we provided you an intangible service, but, you know, we need you to pay us real money. And um, I think that because I spent 10 years in that industry, it really groomed me because imagine you're collecting money on an intangible service, something that you know, no one ever saw happening, but it did happen. Mm -hmm. so a package was moved from point A to point B, and now we expect you to pay us for it. All right. So in this case, we have a physical product that can be recalled, but it was completely useless as it was customizable for the customer. We really wanted to get paid. They were unaware of that. So as many orders as they were putting in, because the cash flow on the back end wasn't coming back in, the receipts weren't being paid, they were running into a problem in manufacturing. Uh, they weren't able to pay their suppliers and get more materials in. Now, most people would say, well, we'll get to collect the money and we'll start harping up and down on this and make a big deal, get the money in, then we'll, we'll buy more material and we'll go fill the orders. And what was happening was the reverse. Because they had less material, they were backlogging the orders, which was frustrating the customers and allowing the opportunity for competition to come in and fulfill those orders. Because mm -hmm. so, all the customer had to do was make a phone call and say, eh, cancel it. Right. Right. Send back my deposit and cancel it. We went through the, pro, uh, the program within the collections department and transformed how they react and respond and deal with the clients. They implemented a grading program wherein they were able to tell customers or their, um, their buyers, uh, you know, uh, suppliers and, and all these different agents working with them, you know, you have a great payment record with, with us going on and you want, that's an A. And if you, you miss one, it's a B. And if you miss two, it's a C. And we don't do businesses with Ds. Okay? So what happened was these, these uh, active agents that were out there selling were proactively making sure the client was getting the information, getting the bills, getting the payments back to the company in time to keep the cash flow. Uh, again, that's communication. That's collaboration. What had happened was the people in the field didn't actually know that the money wasn't being collected by the people in the office. Right. They weren't talking to one another. Well, their, their whole goal is to drive the sales, get the sales, and make that, that other piece. So one hand's not talking to the next, and then... Right. And their job is not to collect the money. 
what they needed was the information. What they needed was the awareness. Right. They needed to have communications. So the department identified that blind spot that was missing, and then it just, it within less than 30 days, it just completely transformed how the business was operating. All of a sudden, the bank accounts were full, and money was flowing in left and right. Manufacturing was ordering materials, and customers were getting supplied ahead of schedule with, with their orders, which was always, if you can supply um, service people uh, above their expectations and under the amount of time that they believed it was going to take, you, it's a win-win. Uh, another area was looking in the financial industry. A lot of people, the industry is losing a lot of people because it's so difficult to actually go and become a licensed and certified financial advisor. Once you become that, you then have to go out and market your services. Mm. Now, if you have a ton of experience, several decades, it's easy. If you have a, a certain market already established, it's easy. But if you're brand new, it can appear to be crushing. And the numbers in the industry are proving that because the turnover rate, the attrition rate is very, very high. And having spent several years in that industry, finding a market was easy for me. Identifying you know, simple questions. What do you want to do? Uh, I, it, was, it was hysterical that my entire program was written up on a three by five card. Uh, we had a training session that lasted, went through several hundred people, and I would go through the diagrams and the questions, and I could, if I had it with me, I could show you that breakthrough was one conversation with them, and I boiled it all down into a simple process and, and wrote it on a three by five card. And by a diagram, not lengthy words, just a diagram of what their whole process looked like, they were able to go out and repeat that with the clients, their prospects. They can go out and market with that, and everybody got it. So what they were given was, yes, you, you're 25, and you're 55, and you're 35, and you have this experience, and you have that license. But what they all got was a very, very easy to duplicate piece of their business that was missing. That came out of our sessions. And <laughs> it, the results proved the results. You, know, you go out and do, somebody was doing a $10,000 deal within a couple of weeks, so now doing $500,000 in million dollar deals. Somebody who was lackluster in handling insurance because they didn't know how to show people or talk to people, now suddenly is doing 10 and 15 applications a week. That's real productivity. That's real performance improvement. That's exciting, and which business or organization wouldn't want to uh, train a uh, change? And I think it's a different perspective on training uh, as well because it is so key, and oftentimes you, you, they don't have time. They don't they're not in time, their money, and so on and so forth for that. But training is it's critical for the growth and development of any organization mm -hmm. and um, that you, you're running efficient more so than anything else. It's the wastage, and oftentimes, they don't see it. They, they mm -hmm. think they have everything going and all the great things, but they oftentimes can see it. A lot of small businesses are primed and propped to be a mid-sized organization, but what's going to make that is actually going in and providing them with some training services so they can see what's not quite there yet. Right. Fill, you know, find the gap and fill it. And I, and I think my background, is, I've been blessed. You know, there's times where you look and you say, um, well, Jack of all trades, master of none, or, or much a generalist. But I, again, I've been blessed with the executive level. I've been blessed with the rank and file. I've, I've worked from the bottom on up and back down in companies. And, and speaking of training, I have been a corporate trainer, a corporate coach, and I've been responsible for as many as 105,000 people on five different continents. What's interesting is that it's always been about helping people succeed. And when you do that, whether it's your coworker, your boss, your client. So long as your people being of service to people, you're going to win. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining us. Um, this is My Business, Your World, Dr. Graham, with my guest, Mr. Robert Christensen. I think it's a wrap. I, because I sh we shook hands or so on, I wanted to make it easier for him to just...